what I had just been asking about really was how do you take this concept of good UX user design is good UI user interface and vice versa? How do you take that concept? Because we've all been there where we've looked at a website and tried to find, as you had said before, the call to action button or even, hey, how do I pay for this thing? I'm trying to trying to get yeah. something from this website. How do I how do I get this? Or even some of those websites of um there you know it's a nonprofit and you're trying to donate or you know you know they don't have a lot of money on the on one end but that UX and UI that combination is so important and I want to draw this metaphor what does that look like in the classroom so I'm a classroom teacher I'm teaching students from grades K to 12 how do I know that I have good UX and UI and the and and vice versa so could you draw yeah. that for us I, absolutely. I think I think you you do it without even realizing it. I, I would say I think that when you start your class in the beginning of you know uh, before before the classes start up, I think you're thinking about the classroom setup. You're thinking about the images on the walls, um, things of that nature. You're thinking about what, how can I position something in a place where my students will get the maximum benefit from it. And if you're not, that's something to think about. It's thinking about where. I can position things to towards a, a, a section of my my room where um, students will see it every day. You know, um, even, at, even I think even like here at on the campus, I've I've heard this before, where um, because you know you think about when I went to school, it's a, it's a different generation, right? We we didn't have cell phones, and with cell phones now, when people are walking, they are looking down on their device. So if you have flyers that you're putting up for people to see. Well, they're not looking at them because they're walking past them. However, the best places for them are in when they're waiting in line, when they're in an elevator, when they're in places where they have to be a little bit more stationary and they have to start looking for a button to press or something like that. They'll notice well, it. And, and yeah. That's why stall talk here at GCU Correct. is so popular. Uh, spoiler alert, folks, the stall is the bathroom stall. So if you don't have reading material on the back of the door in the bathroom, if that's where you, <laughs> you eyeballs. Okay, thank you for, for drawing that. And I know you have a case study that you're going to, or uh, yeah, an so, example of, of what good UX and good UI looks like. Absolutely, yeah. So let me take you through it. So this is a project that was done by a, a, a former student of mine who just graduated. His name is Tori Barton. And um, he created a uh, this therapy pod application. And so um, let me take you through this presentation that he did. Uh, sorry, one second. There we go. Okay. Um, so mental health has been in, in high, high crisis in the United States. Every one in five American adults is dealing with mental disorders. That's around 40% of the population. Three of the biggest disorders plaguing the nation are high anxiety, uh, depression, and ADHD. And so right now what Tori is doing, he's defining the problem that he's getting into. He's thinking about, you know, what's what's the issue? And then he gets more into some data on this subject matter. He gets into, according to the CDC, around 31% suffer from some sort of anxiety. Uh, around 17% of American adults suffer from depression, being one of the most severe out of uh, um, out of three causing, uh, um, sorry, causes around uh, 100, about 132 suicides a day in the United States. Um, and then finally, about 10.5 uh, Americans are currently living with attention deficit disorder as well. And um, traditional therapy people have been avoiding. So the problem here also is that people don't tend to want to go towards traditional therapy because it's um, there's a stigma attached to it. It's expensive. It's a lack of access. They, you know, they feel awkward. And so now he's introducing the product and how this is going to solve that problem of people going to therapy sessions. That's why Stellar creates a truly unique experience, bringing alternative therapies into the space that serves an inexpensive um, escape. So using the five senses, Stellar targets therapies such as aroma, light, sound, and mind, any other pain points that the consumer may have inside a fully customized room. So the idea of this came from um, Japan where there are hotels that are set up with these little mini pod spaces and they have fully controlled temperature, atmosphere, and, you know, privacy at a very low cost. And so the idea here would be 
um, here's how our here's how the pod would work. As the user rents the capsule, the lounge is in a zero gravity chamber. The user has control over things like light, brightness, scent, power, and other, um, but controlled by a tablet. So as you can see here, this was his prototype and um, you know UI elements that he created. So this is him going through and showing the how the app is used and how the consumer would interact with it, and then. And then he talks about some personas. He talks about who the users would be. And so we get into here's Jacob. He's a 40 year old uh, remote finance worker who is a single dad of three kids and suffers from anxiety. And Jacob uh, wants to incorporate therapy into his busy life. And um, he does not know what kind of therapy he needs. So he creates a new Stellar account. And so what Tori is doing is he's showing you the onboarding process for bringing somebody onto this app and, um, you know, all the different questions that need to be asked to understand the user so the app can best help treat the user. And so um, here they start going through and they start thinking about different types of anxiety and different types of relaxing sounds or sense that would really help them as they think through um, as they think through their own stress. And, so, and then so we have back a, to empathy. Yeah. So he's, he's going yep. back to empathy here. Okay. And that is correct. He's absolutely this, going back to empathy. Okay. Keep going. That's this is fascinating. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. No. And then, so now he starts, so now we start to, we see a different persona. We see Sarah um, um, Connell. She's um, an executive at a marketing game. She's 36 years old. She has limited time and money and spend uh, to spend and suffers from ADHD. Um, Sarah understands the current struggle with mental health and is looking for a way to provide therapy experience inside her office space for her and her coworkers to use. Sarah can use some of her break time to experience therapy in, inside the Stellar Pods daily. And so when we see her experience, Sarah already has an account with Stella, so she logs in. She wants to reserve a pod. She picks it on reserve. She chooses the pod module she wants to um, customize. Then she goes through a series of steps and customize her pod experience. And in our business, what we call this, this is called um, a user story, okay? It's, okay? So think of a user story in this way. It's, um, it's all the little interactions that you have to go through to get a particular task done. And it's, it's, so in other words, um, if I'm going to, let's say I'm going onto my phone, how do I get to my mail application and find my inbox? That would be a user story. You would navigate out the user flow of how a person would do that. And that, so what Tori is doing, he's taking each one of these personas and he's highlighting a story that each of these users is going to go through to, to complete a task. So that's what you mean by user flows. Um, mm -hmm. Correct. You have to, and so what I hear is what I see from an educator standpoint is all the details, all the prep work that has to go in before the lesson becomes the lesson. Um, I want to make sure that my students, you know, go from point A to point Z. But in order to do that, I have to make sure that I have so many sets of scissors, so many sets of crayons. Um, I have to make sure that uh, they have a place to go. And I have to, in my head, make sure that each detail is accounted for before the lesson becomes a reality. Uh, otherwise, chaos can ensue is what you're saying. Absolutely. So think of it this way too, when you do your lesson, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. When you do your lesson planning, right? Think of how you have to complete certain lessons before you can move on to the next one because they're more prerequisites that need to be completed. If you don't complete them, you're never going to be able to understand the knowledge to move on to the next section. So the user goes through the same thing. We have to be mindful of how they need to have certain knowledge to click on certain parts of this uh, to move through their app through the application. So in this field and, of user mm -hmm. experience, user design do you find that you have to be a very detail oriented person um, or kind of see the bigger picture or just you're doing both of both and? Yeah, absolutely. I, so I always feel like you can learn to become more of a detailed oriented person. I think, I don't think you're, you're born that way. And that's it. Like, don't get me wrong. I think that some people are better at it than others. It comes easier for them, but no, I think you, yeah, you definitely need to have the ability to see the bigger picture um, and not just such a, a microscopic view of one little part and you have to look at everything and from a really holistic perspective and um again just at, at the same time like i would think look at things holistically 
look at things empathetically. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, I think those are probably the two biggest part. And then, like I said, attention to detail is always good. I, I think attention to detail is probably good for almost every job you're ever in. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. Thank you. This is an incredible student story. This is, this, this is uh, really, uh, really intense. And I'm, I'm hoping that it actually exists stellar. Yeah. Oh, no. And, and well, it's it's a really cool idea. And again, the class is called Designing for New Technology. So the student um, researches different technologies that are out there and sees how they can improve some other aspect of life or something like that. And um, oftentimes, you know, you'll get this when you teach in my area, people think we're also developers and that's not the case at all. A developer or software engineer. Those are the people that will take the designs that we do and they will develop, like, write out code that will make it an actual living thing. And when I always talk to students, I always tell them what we do is actually theory. And what a developer does is actually taking that theory and putting it into practice. It's becoming the real thing. And so we give our designs to them and basically they sh we ship it to the developer so the developer can and then take that idea and they make it come to life. And so whenever I say prototyping and making something animate and move, we use software and programs that do that already um, that help us do that from a non-development or programming mindset. So, you know, um, so a lot of students get really worried when they come into this major, they think they have to do a lot of develop like coding. And they, I, I tell them, honestly, you, you learn to understand what coding is and how it works, but you, when your job, you will probably do zero of it or a very limited amount of it. Okay. So what you're saying is that uh, if I go into design, I don't have to know, I, I need to know the back of the house development a little bit, but not to the extent where I'm actually coding all day. I'm giving Correct. It's, advice or uh, I, I'm giving advice to a coder. Like, here's what I need it. To yeah, do. it's it's an understanding. And okay. so that way you understand how structure is built and stuff like that. It's not it's not necessarily about you sitting there coding. So like in schools, we'll, t we'll have a coding class that they have to take. Um, and that's important that it's just, but again, it's like, it's no different than someone taking a philosophy course. Maybe you don't use philosophy as a mathematician every day of your life. However, um, that somehow trickles into um, your, you know, your your theories and stuff like that. And thinking of and your philosophy just expands your mind and forces you to think a little bit deeper, even from a mathematical perspective. I, I love it, and I and I love that. Metaphor. So from an educator standpoint, if you're looking at students and you're really wanting them to increase their ability to become a designer, really having some attention to detail, empathy, um, uh, that holistic concept, but mm -hmm. also knowing the technology well is a great first step, it, it sounds like to me. I love your ship to software engineer. So uh, there's <laughs> ship moving a lot. It's like, okay, you Let's talk to the software engineer. The software engineer might knows the back of the house there, the, you know, what yeah. code to get that button to do what you want it to do. But you had to be very clear about what you want your button to be able to do. Is that correct? Yeah, it's actually correct. And also this process is so linear. The truth is you're going to involve your developer from an earlier on process too. Like, you know, that's where collaboration, you have to be good at that too, being able to collaborate with others and have, and again, part of that, thinking back to empathy, we need to have conversation with the developer to make sure that what we're proposing and what we're doing can actually happen. And so that kind it's, it's not so we, I do this chunk, you do that chunk, and then we send it over here. It's, it's not quite like that. It's more of a, you know, more of a circular uh, pattern going through. We're, we're creating, we're, we're, we're thinking through a process, we're ideating on it, we're revising it, and we're, we're constantly doing that as we go throughout the entire um, the design process. Thank you so much, Chris. And I will tell you, um, as we move into the next segment, I'd love to know more about this concept of ideating and cyclical processing in UX UI, because this is what happens in, in STEM and engineering all day long. And uh, yeah. on our website, we have so much STEM focused content that allow teachers to just really become better instructors. And so much of that has to do with the words that you're using right here, design, prototyping, testing, mm -hmm. revising, ideating. 
So as we move into the next segment, I'd love to hear about how in a UX UI design course, that same concept, that STEM, or shall we say STEAM concept, yeah. really has, has some legs to it. Professor Murphy, I am thrilled about what you talked about earlier, your student um, example. Uh, it, it's so key that the user interface, the user design have to work together. If you don't have a good user interface and, and you have a good user design, it doesn't make it big, as big of a difference. So I see that where you're coming from. And I, we have a lot of STEM focused content on our site. We often talk about the engineering design process, this cyclical process of designing a solution to a problem. And really that's what we're doing in STEM education. Now, taking this to STEAM education, it all starts with the user. So you really add that empathetic voice to mm -hmm. um, to design. And you did, you did talk about, you're not the software developer on the back end of the house where you're doing the code, but you're influencing the code. You're, you're telling the, the developer if this type of button will work or will it not work. So from the perspective of STEM, that engineering design process, uh, where we're getting students to solve problems um, by prototyping and testing and revising and then sharing out. The next examples I actually have, I actually go through that these are the different types of interfaces that we do design. So for example, this is a website. This is called the landing page. It's for what's called lead generation, which just means basically a fancy word for saying we're collecting people's emails. You all do this. Everyone submits their email for some kind of free, you know, gift or something like that. And you're, you're giving away your information. Then we have the UI that we've been talking about for application designs and so on. And then we have dashboard design and, and how data gets uh, data visualization gets um, tracked and analyzed, but it has to be communicated in a visual way. And then uh, this was actually me at the, uh, Mall of America years ago, when we were visiting some family up there. And this is an interactive kiosk where it gives you uh, different directions on locations in the mall. It's fantastic. And wow. I found this to be an incredibly useful tip, but that's something that we would design, not develop, but we would design for that type of uh, product. And then, you know, game, gamification, you know, tracking and awards and statistics and stuff like that. Like that's another thing that this, this particular field works through. And then I just love this group. This is a, this is a, an agency called fantasy. They are amazing. They just do some really creative interactive work. And this is just, I mean, you, all you're doing here is you're picking your age and it's got this fantastic monster like animation happening and just really creative UI. And this same group um, has done work for, um, uh, Royal Caribbean, where this is for their app that you get around on Royal Caribbean, and it actually shows you the different deck locations and um, where things are on the actual, uh, you know, uh, cruise line. And so it, it's got a, it's got a great, you know, again, there's so many places to go with in this major in terms of what's opportunities that are out there. It's really incredible. I'm, just, I'm excited to allow our K-12 uh, partners to see where students can actually get that design um, area in school. So to continue on not only web design, but design for, for other uh, devices, it seems, uh, whether it's a, a watch or a phone or whatever new technology is coming out. I'm interested to know a little bit more about how AI is, is, is developing design. I will tell you that many of our teachers, we use Canva and Canva has something called Magic Media, which is, uh, you know, creating graphics, utilizing AI. So very, very excited about the field. And um, are there any other examples that you'd like to share with us, uh, Professor? Um, yeah, you know, I think I think the thing now is what I would tell people is I would not necessarily example, but I would just tell them, I think the biggest thing is when you're when you're walking around the world, look at just different things that you interact with, different elements that you interact with in your life. And then think to yourself, is that the best way it could be? And that is what a UX and UI designer does every day. It makes going out everywhere impossible, but it's, um, you know, you're just, you're constantly <laughs> you're thinking constantly about asking those questions, thinking about how I can make this better. Absolutely. Okay. 
Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to get, I love that. I always ask at the end of our um, webinars, you know, what sort of takeaway does our audience have? And for me, I, I just say, absolutely. That is a wonderful takeaway. So as you walk around your school building, as you walk around, maybe the playground, think about, is this the best it could be? And uh, if, if not, what sorts of design could we create as a school, um, it's a great project-based learning project to allow your students to understand, okay, how can we go and solve this problem? And, and oftentimes it's starting, you know, with the, with the end in mind, but starting at that beginning piece of research. Okay. Well, what do students want? Let's talk to them. Let's see how we can solve this problem. Yeah. I also got um, this concept of looking at UX UI as, as holistic, but um, empathetic and then an attention to detail. So thank you so much, Professor Murphy, for your for your talent, your skills. Now, uh, Chris, before I let you go, what mm -hmm. what questions do students need to ask if they want to jump into design? I, about I think I think the big thing is something I want to touch upon you. That something that you said earlier, which is, do you need to be, have an attention to detail? Um, and, and I think it, it comes down to you, like it. Think about you as a person and what you, how you tend to gravitate towards, like from a personal level. Are you someone that's highly organized? Are you someone that really likes to focus on bigger picture items and then also get really into the details later on? Um, are you into, you know, your, your thoughts are always about how I can help and better improve the user. And I think that will, you know, that will help you guide you if you really have a passion for this type of work. I love that. So how can you help others? Well, what a wonderful way to end this discussion mm -hmm. about, um, about user interface, user design. If you want to serve one another in this area, I, I highly recommend that you all come to Grand Canyon University and take Professor Murphy's classes. Thank you so <laughs> much. And please subscribe here for more PD. We want to make sure that we bring you what you're interested in hearing, seeing, knowing more about here at Grand Canyon University. We are all about serving our, filling our wells so we can fill others' wells and uh, to absolutely uh, find our purpose. So thanks so much. I appreciate it, Professor Murphy. Until next time. Thank you for having me.